This meeting is being, is being recorded. A very good evening to all of you. Myself, Dr. Jamuna, heading clinical excellence and research team at Cure Health. I welcome you all for today's webinar session. We will be discussing on very important topic, which is presently the talk of the town, rising cases of heart attack among youth. Our guest speakers for today are Dr. Babu Reddy, an expert senior cardiologist, and Dr. Deepa, fitness and nutrition specialist. Firstly, for those who do not know about our company, Cure Health, I would like to give you a brief introduction. Cure Health is a conversational AI company delivering personalized care at scale. At Cure Health, our vision is to save lives for proactively. Our mission is to improve patient quality of care, patient safety, patient care adherence, and patient awareness. Our user-friendly app, CureBook, has more than 2,500 care plans and diet plans under 30 different health specialities. These plans will help to improve patients' health condition by monitoring vitals, symptoms, and everyday lifestyle management activities, which are specific to the disease condition. Our care concept program consists of expert care team. They include specialist doctors, dietitians, physiotherapists, counselors, and highly skilled care coordinators who remotely monitor your health condition through regular follow-up calls and make sure that you adhere to the care plan regimen activities, you take medication on time, and also they make sure that you eat healthy food that is listed in your diet plans. And most importantly, our newly introduced Cure Home technology is an all-in-one at home, 24 bar seven bedside remote monitoring system. This is designed and developed specifically keeping in mind elderly patients at home and patients with chronic conditions like cancer, diabetes, heart issues, kidney diseases, etc. Cure Home technology reverses the current way of at-home care. Patients need not do anything except to follow the extremely user-friendly and friction, frictionless care plan regimen activities, whether it is using a Bluetooth-enabled vital device or recording a symptom, calling a care coordinator or even a family caregiver. Patient just have to ask Sheila to do so, and it is as simple as using a remote to switch on the TV. Before we start today's webinar, I would like to introduce you all to our guest speakers for today. So Dr. Babu Reddy is a renowned cardiologist with more than two decades of experience. He pursued his MBBS from Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute, and he did his MD in General Medicine from Vijayanagara Institute of Medical Sciences, WIMS, Bellari. And he has completed his DNB in Cardiology from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and Research Center, Ernakulam. His area of excellence is coronary angiogram, non-invasive cardiology, cardiac procedure, cardiography, chest pain treatment, interventional diagnostic, and PDA device closure. Dr. Babu Reddy is associate professor at Jaydeva Institute of Cardiovascular Research and Sciences, Bangalore. We are very honored to have you with us today, doctor. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Deepa is a well-known fitness nutritionist in Bangalore. She did her bachelor's in life science and master's in sports physio uh, physiology and nutrition. She pursued her PhD in sports nutrition from Ain Scientist University. She's a, uh, she's a certified diabetes educator and has more than a decade of experience in the field of food science and nutrition. She worked as a senior dietitian in various institutions and provides diet consultations and nutrition seminars to athletes. She has conducted seminars, workshops, one-on-one -on -one consultations on nutrition and telephonic diet counseling for various corporate offices and schools. Thanks for joining today's webinar session, Dr. Deepa. Thank you. I would also like to inform all the viewers, you can type your questions in the comment section and these questions will be answered at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session conducted by Dr. Isha. So let's begin our webinar session on heart failure. <laughs> when we talk about statistics for heart issues worldwide, as per World Health Organization reports, an estimated of 
9 million people died from cardiovascular diseases in 2019. It almost represents 32% of all the global deaths. Out of these, 85% were due to heart attack and stroke. The global annual number of deaths from heart and circulatory disease is projected to rise to more than 23 million by 2030 and more than 34 million by 2060. The rising concern in heart attacks is becoming more common in younger people, especially women. Heart attacks once was characterized as part of old man's disease. It is now increasingly occurring in younger people due to various reasons. This webinar provides a comprehensive understanding of the causes of heart attacks and the prevention of the risk of getting uh, heart attacks in younger people. Let's begin our session with Dr. Babu Reddy. So, uh, doctor, please yeah. explain to our audience about the various types of cardiovascular diseases and what are their risk factors and the warning signs. Okay. So, good evening. First of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Jamuna for this opportunity and uh, we will uh, have uh, some uh, insights into the heart attack in young people. So, what is the reasons? So, what may be the causes or why it is changing trend? So we will, so firstly, so the heart attack commonly used to occur after the age of the 60 years is the, uh, the norm. So, but last few decades, like last two decades or so, we are seeing heart attacks happening younger than you know, 50 years or 40. We call that by definition, so young MI are a premature heart attack. These are the words we use for the young, uh, the heart attack happening below the 50 years, we call it as a young heart attack or premature heart attack. So last decade or so, if you are seeing one third of heart attack, that means if a hundred heart attack happens in a society, so around almost 30% of the heart attack are below the age of the 50 years. This is what the trend you see. In that, if you see 20% 20, 20 is below the age of 40 years, that, that is really uh, uh, this one. So it has to be in the society. If a person comes with a heart attack below the 40 years, that is the most productive uh, period of his life. So that is a worry. So, and nowadays what we are seeing is, so the, uh, the young elder people, like parents are bringing the patient, his son or daughter for the uh, coronary artery disease or heart attack. So this is the reason why it is very alarming uh, 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 the situation in our society. So why, what could be the reasons? So we are seeing a lot of changes in our lifestyle. So a lot of sedentary lifestyle, one of the reason and work stress is one which is happening uh, recently the increasing trend and obesity diabetes this has increased risk factors in younger people so what we call for a heart attack is a traditional risk factors and non traditional risk factors so the traditional risk factors are the risk factors which are commonly causes for the heart attack which is as we all know the diabetes hypertension high cholesterol and smoking, these are all traditional risk factors for the heart, heart problems. These risk factors were common in elderly people. But nowadays, because of the change in our lifestyle, what we are seeing, these risk factors are more and more, and more are seen in younger people. Apart from these traditional risk factors, like non-traditional risk factors like stress, work stress is a non-traditional non risk factors, and a sedentary lifestyle. So sedentary lifestyle, which leads to so many other risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and obesity all comes with this baggage. So these are the commonest causes for, even though now young people, so these are common causes for heart attack. But there are un unconventional causes like use the drug abuse in younger people uh, is one of the leading cause nowadays we are seeing the heart attack in young people. So any other... Uh, uh, Doubts, if anything is there, we can uh, just yeah, answer yes, in a specific yes. way. And also an alarming trend in heart disease has taken hold among younger uh, adults, doctor. So we have been hearing about cardiac arrest cases among film fraternity um, yeah. more recently. And also uh, in one of the interviews, Dr. Devi Shetty, the founder and chairman of Narayana Rudayala, he had mentioned that uh, uh, among Indian population, for everybody above age group of 40 years, uh, uh, they are prone to heart diseases. But what is happening recently is that we are seeing these heart attacks in people under age 40. Yes. And this, this is on a very high rise. 
So, uh, doctor, what do you think? Why uh, heart attacks are more common among younger people nowadays? So, yeah. and and uh, what should be done as a preventive uh, care? Okay. See, the what we are seeing in society, if you consider those who are working in a, a sedentary lifestyle, like for example, in our commonly it is IT industry, like information technology industry, where the people are working near the computer, sitting for a more than six to eight hours in a sitting position, not even moving. So what we call a sedentary lifestyle like this is almost equivalent to the smoking. So we call this sedentary lifestyle is equivalent to the smoking a person who smokes 10 cigarettes per day what risk he has, if he has a person who's sitting for six to eight hours and not doing any exercise. So that type of is also one of the commonest cause. And addition to that, the people has a stress, work stress. That is, they have a targets, they have to do this work at, at a particular time. They are in a continuous stress. The continuous stress, what it causes is it increases our sympathetic activity in the body. So there, there are two systems in our body. What is sympathetic and parasympathetic system? Sympathetic is one which increases the heart rate increases the cardiac output, whereas parasympathetic is the other way around. It comes down the heart and reduces the heart. Rate. So these systems will be working in a balanced way. When a person has constant stress, so this sympathetic activity ratio is more than a parasympathetic activity. This sympathetic activity increases inflammation in the body. Inflammation in turn increases the cholesterol deposition, that is atherosclerosis, what we call is commonly. So when there is a continuous stress, there is a, what we call as a plaque rupture. When the continuous, uh, there is cholesterol deposition, in some areas of the blood vessels, their cholesterol deposition plaque will rupture. So that is like a volcano uh, uh, erupting. So that type of uh, happening, these things will happen in a more frequent way in these type of people. That is the reason why these heart attacks are very common in younger age group, especially in those uh, section of the society which is having sedentary lifestyle. And one more thing what we are seeing in film fraternity also. So one is the stress, another is they are having a, the work stress and the other one is the exercise, the what they are doing. So the work uh, exercise also, Madam uh, Deepa may be explaining about what type of work, uh, what type of exercise we should do. But excessive exercise itself is a cause for uh, the heart attacks. Sometimes we come across many patients who are coming, went for a gym and come back with a heart attack. So especially mm -hmm. recently start started gym. Those people who come up, come with heart attack, this can be explained by plaque rupture. So they may not have a severe diseases all over the blood vessels, but one plaque, small disease, suddenly ruptures and causes a heart attack. So this we have seen in younger group, especially 20 years, 30 years, such type of age groups. Yeah, true, doctor. And also, doctor, according to the Center of D uh, Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, yes. about uh, 1 in 16 women aged uh, 20 and older have coronary heart disease, the most common type of heart disease. And uh, Why are these heart attacks uh, becoming more common in women? Uh, do women experience different kind of symptoms uh, for heart attack uh, compared to men? Or, yes. uh, or do women have different kind of uh, warning signs for heart attack? Correct. So normally, uh, women are more protective for heart attack. That is general norm. That is because of the hormonal difference between the men and women. So the uh, the estrogen which is there in women more in younger population, that is protective for atherosclerosis. That is cholesterol deposition. So that is what we used to study. But uh, and also the risk factors in women were actually one decade later than the men usually to occur. So this trend has been changed nowadays after a few decades or so because the lifestyle. So the women also having experiencing a similar type of like diabetes, for example, if you take the prevalence of diabetes is more common in younger women compared to what it was. So like that, all the traditional risk factors like diabetes, obesity and sedentary lifestyle and smoking, even the smoking, the ratio, if you see the last few uh, decades, the trend of uh, male to female ratio, if you have many studies, the smoking is almost uh, equalizing uh, the uh, trend in uh, how many percentage of women were smoking. So it is also increasing in women population. So that all these uh, changes in the food habits and also the, the lifestyle, which is increasing the trend in women also in anger age group. So that is the reason why the heart attacks are increasing in women. But the presentation wise, the women uh, heart attack presentation in uh, men and women is different. The typical symptoms, what we call this left side chest pain, radiating to the left arm. This is a common uh, presentation of the heart attack. That 
is commonly present in male compared to females. Females, the way they experience pain is more atypical. That means the uh, the area is not may not be left side of the chest pain. They may be having a neck pain or back pain, sometimes headache, sometimes jaw pain. So are sometimes no chest pain, only breathlessness. Uh, that means difficulty in breathing or mm -hmm. just a giddiness. This type of atypical symptoms, that is not usual symptoms of heart attack, which were more common. So what is the impact of these atypical presentation is either they will uh, confuse for other symptoms and go to the general physician for a different reason and detection of the heart attack becomes very late. So heart attack, uh, you have the so time is muzzle we call. So if you don't detect very early, the risk, the mortality that is likely chances of surviving will become less and less. That is important to recognize eh? Uh, the symptoms of heart attack other than the usual symptoms. That is usually is left side chest pain, especially central and radiating to the left associated with vomiting, sweating. These are all common uh, complaints of heart attack. But in women, especially the percentage of people coming with atypical symptoms are much more. So that's why we should recognize these atypical symptoms also. Yeah, true, doctor. And, uh, and doctor, since this uh, COVID wave started, you know, like, the research suggests that about 20, 10 to 20% of people, they are experiencing mid or long-term issues uh, from COVID. So, and uh, uh, and more of the heart cases also uh, we are seeing uh, post-COVID. Is COVID a cause of increased heart attacks among younger adults? Or, uh, or what do you suggest, like uh, in order to prevent uh, heart issues uh, post-COVID, what precautions need to be taken? No. As we all know that COVID is a viral disease. So COVID is a viral disease like any virus. It causes an inflammation in the body. So it is normally we call uh, COVID affects lungs predominantly. But uh, COVID can also cause a generalized inflammation in the body. So COVID also can attack all the other muscles also. So like that, so it can affect the heart in a different way. So one is it affects the muscle directly. We call it cardiomyopathy. So heart becomes weak in those situations. The, because of the viral inflammation, the muscle is not functioning properly. So heart gets dilated and it's not able to function. It's normal. That is one type of heart disease. Whereas the other type is it can cause inflammation in the blood vessels itself, causing the clotting. So as we've seen, so many people with the COVID, they will come with either increased risk of stroke, increased risk of heart attack, increased risk of pulmonary embolism. That means clots form in the veins, it goes to the lungs and causing a breathing difficulty. So these are different presentations. Why This is because of the viral infection, which induces the inflammation, the higher chances of inflammation in the body. So that causes the clotting factors to increase, causing the clotting formation. They may not have it. See, heart attack in a COVID patients, they come with, we do angiogram. So if you look at the blood vessels, the blood vessels are very clean. Only one area, there will be clot. So there is no atherosclerosis there. It is just a formation of the clots in the blood vessels. So definitely COVID induces these clots and we should be careful. So how to prevent this type of heart attacks in COVID, COVID or post-COVID uh, patients? So since there is a more risk of inflammation, so post-COVID you should not do aggressive exercise because there is lung capacity will be less and blood vessel inflammation is there. So first few two to three months of post-COVID, we should be careful about the heart and the blood vessels. So most important, taking an ECG for any complaints and an echocardiogram will rule out at least heart muscle, how is it, how it is functioning. That will prevent, uh, that will, we can rule out the cardiomyopathy or muscle disease. And also looking at the blood uh, test, few uh, basic tests like CRP and uh, uh, CBC, which will give us an inflammatory process, how much it is there. And accordingly, we have to design their exercise protocols and uh, uh, take a doctor's advice post-COVID for two, three months. So first two, three months is very crucial post-COVID. And then during that period, if you control the inflammation, the risk of uh, the, the heart attacks can be reduced. If, for example, few patients has more risk of CRP increased in those cases, we should give some anti-inflammatory drugs or uh, sometimes if the cholesterol is more, we give statins, which will reduce the inflammation. So there are preventive ways, even the drugs, so which can be discussed according to the patient. This one. Definitely the COVID and heart is related and in a different way and the risk is increased post-COVID era in heart attack. Yeah. Thanks, doctor. 
Uh, so now let's discuss with Dr. Deepa some of the uh, fitness and nutrition aspects uh, related to heart care. So Dr. Deepa, we all know that sedentary lifestyle and physical inactivity are modifi modifiable risk factors for heart disease in young adults. How much physical activity and how much exercising or how often exercising is needed to decrease the risk of heart attack? Yeah. Uh, so as uh, you just mentioned, so sedentary lifestyle is one of the uh, you know, risk factors for heart disease. So movement, you know, bo body movement is extremely important and activating all the muscles plays a very important role in uh, kind of combating or preventing uh -huh. heart disease. So heart, uh, heart condition. So I, I suggest or the American Council of Exercise suggests uh, 150 minutes in a week, which is like 30 minutes every day for five days a week. Uh, and moderate exercise, not high intensity exercise, but it's a moderate intensity exercise is what is suggested, uh, which is which will keep uh, you fit enough and uh, you know kind of overcomes that you know the sedentary lifestyle. So this is the basic. I mean, this is for somebody who's not started to exercise, you know, and they want to start. So 150 minutes is a decent enough time in a week to give. Okay. And, and also, doctor, there are many incidents uh, which are reported on sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death while uh, doing high intensity exercises. Right. Uh, does the risk of heart attack increase during strenuous physical activity? Uh, if so, what kind of exercises trigger cardiac arrest and how should this be prevented? Yes. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned, you know, um, cardiac see, movement and exercise are extremely important in overcoming or protecting, uh, protection, giving a protection from heart diseases. That being said, once, you know, off late, if you see, you know, all these incidents that we have heard about are people who probably are in a, uh, are somewhere in a, you know, uh, thing of showing it off, you know, their exercise routines and, you know, they probably kind of want to motivate, okay, in a good way, okay, they want to motivate people. So in that process, probably, you know, they uh, overexert themselves, they do high, high strenuous activity without, see, there is a way in which this, this whole process of exercise goes, you start in a very, uh, you know, when if you have never exercised, you start very slowly and you need to work your way up. So initially, if I have to give it an exact number, so okay, a person probably, if I have to tell you from a treadmill point of view, walks probably in one hour, four kilometers, right? So maybe they might want to increase six kilometers. So that cannot happen in, in you know, in, in two days time, three days time. It is a gradual process. So you give about a week's time or 10 days time, be on it, then slowly increase for about two minutes and again, come back to you. So that kind of a, you know, a movement upwards slowly is, uh, you know, is one of the things that probably these kind of people are lacking. I myself have been a marathon runner and I'm still a marathon runner. I see a lot of those kind of people uh, who kind of push themselves too much. You know, they want to, it's like uh, they're competing with themselves. Okay? It's in a good way. They're competing with themselves. But that being said, you know, there is a way in which you need to work around. So there is a study which suggests that they have found that uh, among uh, running, running events, especially the extreme running events, the blood sample marker, you know, of these people, you know, who, who do extreme uh, high intensity activities contains biomarkers linked with heart related issues. You know, so these markers usually go away on their own. But if if they, they keep on doing it on a regular basis, uh, it may lead to remodeling of the heart and can also lead to issues like thicker heart walls and scarring of the heart. So eventually rising, you know, uh, uh, giving way to heart attacks. So I, you know, my approach or my advice would be that, you know, to go slow, you know, everybody can reach, everybody can work their way up and reach the limits that they want, to, but give, give time. The body should get, should get accustomed, you know, and then if there is a condition where you're feeling short of breath in spite of that pushing, you know, you're very, so many things change, right? In a day, humidity conditions, weather conditions, your own your sleep pattern, so many things, it depends upon everything. So you need to be 100% healthy to even push that little bit, little bit in a, on a weekly basis. So that would be my answer. So moderate intensity activity has shown a lot of benefits among people. So start slow, start being from there to moderate, then to higher intensity. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, doctor, you're right. And also, doctor, please suggest uh, our audience today uh, the best physical exercise program uh, in order to improve their health as well as decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, diseases. And also, uh, you, uh, uh, you can also uh, suggest what kind of precautions and safety tips which someone has uh, with heart disease who is already having this heart disease should take while exercising. Yeah. 
uh, across all i mean like people generally they want to take uh, you know exercising any aerobic activities like you know walking to uh, slow jogging to uh, elliptical you know using the elliptical for exercise you know any of the cycling swimming any of this uh, again let me repeat that i'm going to repeat this word a lot today so it won't be slow to moderate beginning in the beginning you know you start with that that's applicable and for uh, alternating it with weight training kind of weight training also helps in but again with lower weights not high heavier weights so a combination of both of this is a good way to start but uh, what is the amount and time duration will depend from person to person according to their height and weight and stuff like that but uh, on a general rule I, as i mentioned 30 minutes of this kind of activity is good now for people who come with uh, heart disease condition you know maybe it could be a simple thing like a blood pressure you know uh, who are on medication who may not be on medication there are uh, ways in which they need to take precautions so first thing is uh, a people you know these kind of people should start uh, uh, i mean they, they are prone to, especially the people with uh, blood pressure if i have to tell they are on medications uh, either called as there are two types of medications which can become a little issue with them there are there are different types of medications but two specific group of medications called the beta blockers and the diuretics so diuretics if they are on diuretics then you know it kind of uh, you know uh, uh, flushes up a lot of water right so in su such a case all they have to do is carry uh, an additional liter of water when they go for exercise okay beta blockers they need to be uh, you know checking their uh, heart rate you know every uh, every now and then it can go haywire so these are the two uh, group of medications which they need to be uh, people need to be aware of and they need to take precautions other than that any person with high blood pressure any of these conditions should not do isometric holds when i say isometric hold holds it's basically those uh, planks you know and then lifting weights and holding when you're holding right so there is a uh, uh, you know blood pressure increases right so they might tend to the blood pressure might shoot up all of a sudden and it can lead to uh, fatality so i would suggest that not to hold this rather uh, uh, like there is a time they have a, a minute of hold and stuff like that i wouldn't advise that maybe 10 second holds and then multiple conditions so that's what i would say and humid conditions be aware of humid conditions don't extra you know exercise in humid conditions and also if you have a chest pain or uh, uneasiness you know you have some kind of a, a shortness of breath then i suggest not to go for exercise that day and uh, you know go visit your doctor and uh, take uh, their advice about uh, the heart health and um, regularly get your blood blood test done right so to understand you know where your uh, uh, parameters blood parameters stand so these are some of the things that in, they, they need to be uh, careful about okay so uh, yeah so these are the some of the yeah, thanks, Doctor. So now uh, I have one question to Dr. Babu Reddy. So, Doctor, uh, in case of pregnancy, uh, uh, is risk factor uh, of high for pre existing heart disease in women? Uh, or how do preeclampsia and gestational diabetes affect uh, the heart of pregnant women? And what kind of precautions uh, uh, these pregnant women need to take uh, for healthy pregnancy? Correct. So the pregnancy, we have to understand uh, what is the physiological changes happens. I mean, what changes happens in pregnancy, how it affects the heart. So in uh, normally pregnancy, especially second trimester of pregnancy, by that time, the changes in the volume of the blood. So the blood normally we have five to six liters. So it increases uh, because of the pregnancy to almost 10 to 12 liters. So that increases the uh, pressure on the heart and also the volume in the uh, body. So in those patients who have normal heart can handle more than five to six times. So whereas if a patient has some valvular heart disease or a uh, heart is weak or because of the heart attack or previously, anything uh, which caused a limitation is activity of the heart. So they, they can't handle this. So they can present either with breathing difficulty or increase in the heart rate or arrhythmias. So these are all uh, different uh, conditions they can experience. So for a area of pregnancy nowadays, we should have a cardiac evaluation uh, beforehand and see uh, what is the baseline, uh, uh, the condition of the heart, whether it is a normal or any abnormal. So if it is a abnormal, for example, valvular heart disease or a cardiomyopathy. So based on that, you have to take advice and start medications early. So this is a one way of treating. So other second part of the question is uh, the eclampsia and uh, the gestational diabetes. 
So the eclampsia is uh, increased uh, blood pressure in the pregnancy, especially starts at the second uh, trimester again or third trimester. So the pressure uh, are it pre-existing. Uh, some of the people have a pre-existing BP or sugar. So that is a different condition where they have to take medications regularly, control the blood pressure and uh, and the sugar. So the blood pressure in pregnancy because of the volume changes again the pressure will be more than what it will be normal person. So you have to adjust the medications accordingly and those medications should be which are suitable during pregnancy because there should not be any side effects to the fetus. So the such type of drugs should be advised. So those drugs has to be titrated according to the blood pressure to reduce the risk of one is maternal and pregnant complications and also fetal complications. Here both have a complications either uh, during delivery or post delivery because again the volume changes what has happened during pregnancy again it will reverse during the uh, after the labor. So the sudden shift in the volumes that is also a very important. So sudden shift in the volumes also reduces the BP can patient can have a low BP or a higher BP. So those should be monitored very regularly. Sugars, diabetes also, the gestational diabetes, is, is, which occurs during pregnancy. So those uh, high sugars cause a fetal complications like big baby and uh, some of the heart conditions, valvular changes, those complications of the sugar. These should be monitored regularly and control the sugars very well. That will reduce the complications of diabetes. So these eclampsia and gestation diabetes after pregnancy also so there is some sudden uh, percentage of people will have a persistent ibp or persistent sugars so they are at risk for ibp and high sugars so though, so after pregnancy also we should be continuously monitoring these patients whether they will have a normalization of the bp or sugar or they may require medication even after that to prevent complications okay okay doctor and uh, Dr. Uh, Deepa, similar to uh, this uh, Dr. Barbaradi question, like what are the uh, risks and benefits of exercise during pregnancy? Uh, do you uh, suggest pregnant women to exercise regularly? Uh, uh, and if so, please suggest some safety exercises for pregnant right. women. Right. Like as uh, Dr. Babu mentioned, you know, the blood volume actually increases multifold. You know, so there are chances that many pregnant women come with high blood pressure during that time okay so always for this it is not only for this even if it is even if they don't have high blood pressure it is advisable to um, you know uh, do regular workouts but again uh, you know some uh, i have seen this in women who are pregnant who probably were very active till they become pregnant so they they start at that intensity okay so i would suggest not to do that uh, uh, for, i mean the intensity why they need to bring it down for reasons the risk factors as he said that you know the it could be you know uh, uh, i mean uh, preterm baby or you know there might be an abortion or uh, other you know low birth weight of uh, children which a child in the later stages and stuff like that and also many other preeclampsia or you know those kind of conditions also can happen so i would suggest that for them uh, exercise is extremely important and very very uh, you know it plays a crucial role one being it improves the flexibility and you know it kind of helps through the uh, to push through the labor right so contractions you know so if they activate if they kind of work out their pelvic muscles the pelvic floor exercises especially there is something called as prenatal yoga i would always recommend that to uh, you know pregnant women they can also take uh, you know they can also go in for uh, walking and uh, you know, other simple, you know, not very uh, highly pounding or thumping kind of activities, jumping and jarring and those kind of activities they should avoid, but more to do with, uh, you know, uh, walking and simple aerobics, you know, even swimming for that matter, any of these kind of aerobic exercises are highly recommended. And I would suggest prenatal yoga because it has shown, um, you know, uh, people can push through their labor very easily because of the flexibility of the muscles that it gives, you know, during the, uh, during their uh, trimesters, right, first, second and third trimester, the kind of uh, Active, it kind of activates certain muscles, which kind of helps in relaxing them during the labor, and it doesn't get into C-section babies and stuff. So yes, yeah. thanks, doctor. So, uh, doctor Babu Reddy, as you already mentioned, that uh, smoking is one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular diseases among the young adults. So how does the smoking actually contribute to heart attacks? Uh, uh, and also there's another question, like uh, we see that uh, we are always uh, thriving and surviving in a polluted environment, right? And uh, most of uh, the people are exposed to secondhand smoking, where we can call them as passive smokers. Mm -hmm. So uh, how is the risk among uh, these passive smokers for heart attack? 
Yeah, smoking, as we all know, it contains uh, chemicals. What we smoke, it... Uh, one second. So, uh, the smoking uh, has chemicals like tar and nicotine. So, what we smoke, it goes into the, our body. Uh, this will induce inflammation. Induce inflammation, uh, it increases the white uh, white cell count and uh, the inflammatory markers. So, they affect lungs and also the blood vessels. So that is why we see uh, many studies which uh, showed that the heart attack in smokers is much, much, uh, almost 20 times more than uh, non-smokers. So that is the reason the most uh, proper way of it is it in increases the inflammation. The inflammation induces deposition of cholesterol and other material into the blood vessels. If you look at the atherosclerotic uh, changes in those blood vessels of smokers with non-smokers, there is an increased uh, extensive involvement of atherosclerosis in uh, smokers. That's why they have a more risk of uh, uh, inflammation, uh, the heart attack due to plaque ruptures. So that is why it is more common uh, to occur heart attacks in younger people who smoke than non-smokers. So that is a ca common cause. And uh, regarding the question of uh, non, uh, the passive smoking, so it is as riskier as uh, the active smokers because if you are in an environment where there is smoking is common for example a person occupationally who works in bar or some uh, places where the smoking is extensively there and person who's there in that environment is passively taking the smoking so he is also uh, uh, that uh, in, uh, the chemicals are going into his body also so that induces inflammation so it doesn't differentiate whether you are active smoker or uh, passive smoker so that's why second second hand smoking is also as riskier as active smoking and smoking definitely induces heart attacks and also, doctor, you already mentioned that a long working hours, then set because of setting targets and tight deadlines, uh, which this leads to a lot of stress among the working employees. And they are feeling constantly stressed, and this increases the risk of heart diseases. How actually stress leads to heart attack and uh, uh, also stroke among these younger adults? It is understood when it is like uh, elderly people or aged people. But how does this uh, stress induce among uh, these uh, conditions among uh, anger adults? And what are the indications, early indications? Yeah. See, as we told, the constant stress has already I explained uh, in some of the this one. So that's uh, the stress increases our sympathetic activity, which I told. So that has a multiple effects. One is increases the inflammation. Second one is it, uh, stress increases blood pressure. The blood pressure is the risk factor for heart attack. Okay, so these multiple factors play in during that. Uh, so there is an increased stress, increased inflammation, increased blood pressure, and increased heart rate. So stress sympathetic activity means heart rate is increased. So the heart rate is increased means there's a work of heart or heart working at, for example, our heart rate is around 70 per minute is a normal 70 to 100. So if heart rate increases to so 120, for example, so the heart is working and a double uh, that of a normal. So the stress on the heart is increased. So these, if it is constantly going on for days or months and years, so that causes the stress on the heart and the blood vessels. That one point in time that it gives away, that means it causes the problems, that causes sudden heart attack. So these we have seen in individuals who have a work, work pattern where they are working in a targets, especially in uh, IT industry, which we are seeing very commonly. So people coming at 20 or 30 years of age who have come with heart attack, those at workplaces developing a cardiac arrest, these are the common things what we have nowadays we are seeing. So these may be the explanations and these people will have sedentary lifestyle along with this uh, stress. So and will have obesity and other risk factors like diabetes and hypertension also along with that. So it's a multiple factors which plays on particular individual and causing these uh, individuals. So and stress itself, has many multiple effects. What we tell. so because of stress they smoke, because of stress uh, there is a uh, uh, inadequate exercise. So all this because lack of time. So there is a multiple factors playing in individual due to this stress. Oh, what are the indications, doctor? Like uh, these young people who who are uh, like uh, constantly working employees. What what are the uh, you, main indications that they can uh, get a uh, hint like okay something is wrong with my heart. 
Yeah, so uh, one more thing in young people, no, if the patient come, uh, for example, he has some just discomfort. So the confidence level in young individuals, for example, they think it's a more of a gastritis uh, because there is a multiple reasons for chest pain. Uh, so we think it is in younger people because heart attack is less common compared to elderly people. Many people think it is not a heart problem and many times they delay uh, seeking the help of the doctor or sometimes they will not, uh, they will take a gastric tablet or some syrup or some uh, this one and then they will delay it. So that causes more uh, mortality than uh, uh, seeking a medical help. And so identification of heart disease in younger people is less common compared to the uh, elderly people because elderly people always seek attention earlier than younger people. So that that indications any chest discomfort or you're not feeling well, uh, giddiness, these things has to be uh, kept in mind and uh, simple tests like ECG can uncover the, uh, the disease. So that is very important. And most and of the times because of the stress, lack of sleep is also one of the of major uh, risk factors. Yeah, so uh, you you also mentioned, Doctor, already lack of sleep is one of the major causes. So uh, nowadays, you very well know that sleeping pattern has changed uh, among these uh, uh, younger populations, and uh, especially in the uh, metro cities. You know, like uh, they work in shifts, and many work during night shifts. Okay. So, uh, what what do you advise uh, to these people who work in different shifts and uh, whose sleeping pattern is uh, varying uh, with the normal uh, sleep cycle? Yeah, see, the most important we should understand is sleep is very, very, very important uh, for our uh, routine health because sleep is a time where the repair work happens. For example, whatever we uh, do the activity, there is stress or something. So it all heal in the night when you sleep. So sleep up to uh, uh, in adults, the recommendation is around six to eight hours of good sleep. So sleep is, uh, is, is very important for our body to recover from whatever the damages happen during our activity. So that is the reason why anybody who is uh, sleeping less than six hours, the mortality has been increased in observational studies. That's the reason why we, whatever may be the, uh, the shift they are working in, but they should make sure they should have a good uh, sound sleep of six to eight hours. So at least uh, six hours of sleep is uh, very essential. And uh, it's not that uh, whether you are working in the night or day, but you have to make sure that your pattern should be, it is, our body is having circadian rhythm. That means we have uh, the sleep cycle and also active cycle. So if you are working in a night time, so at least daytime, you should make sure at least six hours, there is no disturbance. That is very important. Yeah, true, true, doctor. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Deepa, uh, I would like to uh, throw some light on uh, childhood obesity. Nowadays, this has become a very serious problem uh, because of sedentary lifestyle and also due to the consumption of fast food and sugary soft drinks. Uh, are these overweight children at uh, risk of uh, heart disease uh, equal to adults? Uh, and uh, how does obesity in children affect uh, their heart health? Right. Okay, so if you see uh, what exactly is obesity, obesity is basically a lot of accumulation of fat, right? So fat cells, excess accumulation of fat cells induces inflammation. So any inflammation triggers off, you know, I mean, it kind of releases some kind of hormones, which, which in turn, uh, you know, uh, re, re, uh, makes, I mean, inflammation. So this inflammation can lead to any of these, you know, conditions like, you know, high cholesterol and high. Uh, if uh, one good thing is that, at that time, as a childhood, they are definitely prone. There is a definite connection. In fact, it is also seen, studies have stated that, uh, you know, children, childhood obesity, when they have their heart, you know, the modeling of the heart or the structure of the heart kind of changes. It kind of, you know, um, I mean, is prone to heart conditions at a later stage. It's a recent study that I, uh, you know, read some. Okay, so definitely there are there is a, a chance of these uh, childhood obesity you know resulting in heart attacks but the good thing is that early intervention always can you know uh, you know prevent them uh, from not getting into that yes so yeah and also doctor uh, regularly consuming this unhealthy junk food uh, may make the immune system very weak right yes yes so uh, so will this foods uh, that lack immunity boosters affect heart and uh, how are this uh, immunity and heart health interrelated 
yeah so uh, actually uh, if you see what are you know lack of immune or immune less foods okay or basically all these processed foods you know um, uh, white flour and white bread and stuff like that so they have nothing you no know, no minerals no they are all robbed of nutrients and at the end of it, it they are just only a simple glucose right so they kind of uh, you know and if overeating if that adds to that it only results in uh, you know obesity and stuff like that right so also there is a uh, increasing evidence which is uh, su suggesting that the t cells you know which are a part of lymphocytes or the so called immunity you know responses uh, which induce the anti inflammatory macrophages right have an important role in protecting against cardiovascular disease so definitely it is a uh, uh, you know there is a straight uh, in fact they say that heart itself is an immune station that's the uh, uh thing you know how the immune system and the cardiovascular system communicate is not known yet but then there is definitely a, a clear cut connection between both of them so uh when you say immune rich foods what do they contain basically they have all these uh, antioxidants right so antioxidants. vitamin c ascorbic acid is an antioxidant right so they are heart protective because they also combat the free radical damage right so uh, so in eventually they reduce the oxidation in the body and then reduce the inflammation which means that you are heart healthy or overall healthy so that's all so uh, like you rightly said doctor antioxidants are the immune boosters so what kind of foods uh, will you suggest uh, okay. in order to promote heart health okay um high okay foods high uh, foods that are not processed okay unprocessed foods like you know your whole grain cereals and pulses of course we need to know what fiber we all know what fiber is because we've been hearing about it so fiber is extremely important you know uh, uh, i would say complex carbohydrates i will i will divide it into all the nutrients and i'll talk about you know what so ca carbohydrates should not be the simple ones simple ones can be had at certain point of time but not always okay so carb the ca complex carbohydrates uh, meal consisting of whole grain cereals and pulses with a lot of vegetables okay freshly uh, you know seasonal uh, vegetables or seasonal fruits okay so this should be your part of your daily uh, uh, you know eating habit and uh, good fats with uh, protein content okay all this this combination also when i when i uh, and minerals and vitamin rich foods which are again nothing but your antioxidants so antioxidants are heart healthy so they uh, you need to include your vitamin c which is ascorbic acid from all your you know guava and uh, broccoli and you know uh, indian gooseberry etc then comes your vitamin e which is your tocopherol which, is, which comes from your nuts right uh, and all your cooking oils that's and then you have your beta carotene which is your vitamin a which is again available in any bright colored vegetables and fruits plus your milk in milk products okay then you have your polyphenols which you get it from your green tea as well as your uh, uh, you know dark chocolate okay and flavonoids which come from apples strawberries and blueberries and and then there are two minerals which are selenium and zinc which also are antioxidants which are available in strawberries and you know yogurt and oat milk so you should have a combination you should have a combination of major macronutrients that is coming from your complex cereals complex grains then your protein content then your fats which are from good fats with a mineral and uh, you know uh, a vitamin profile all of them you know it should be be a part of your uh, diet with a of course uh, activity every day yeah yeah and also doctor there are uh, many people who are on aspirin or uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory uh, drugs right. Right. so they consume it on daily basis uh, in order to reduce their uh, risk of heart disease right. so are there any natural foods that act as blood thinners and which will uh, facilitate this uh, blood flow and decrease the risk of heart disease yes yes there are definitely so especially if you have heard you know which we regularly use these are all foods which you regularly use one is okay there i am going to talk about five foods which are which are the so called anticoagulants or blood thinners okay the first one is uh, turmeric right turmeric contains curcumin curcumin is an active ingredient in uh, you know it it has an anti inflammatory and blood thinning blood thinning or an anti coagulant uh, property then comes your ginger ginger contains actually it stops uh, blood clotting it contains a natural acid called as salicylate so uh, the aspirin also contains you know acetyl salicylic acid okay it's a synthetic derivative so and the salicylate is a potential uh, blood thinner so ginger which we can 
use it in you know our foods or you can have your ginger tea you know all uh, you can make it a part of uh, things like that turmeric you can of course uh, I, i'm sure many of them would have heard about turmeric latte right so you can have that as a uh, thing to include that also you can include it in your cooking daily cooking then you have your cayenne peppers okay cayenne peppers also contains pow uh, powerful blood thinning agents because they also contain salicylates cayenne peppers are nothing but those you know the small chilies very very uh, pungent and very spicy chilies okay so they are also of course you cannot have them on a you know like just the way it is like that you can kind of add it to your meals and uh, you know have it so they are also potential blood thinners then comes your vitamin e again vitamin e of course you get it from your cooking oils as well as nuts okay so they are also uh, they also are uh, anticoagulants or they stop uh, blood clotting okay then comes your uh, garlic which is you know um, in antibiotic and antimicrobial properties also it is a uh, supposed to reduce as the blood clotting uh, Thing. then you have your cinnamon okay so cinnamon is it contains coumarin which is a powerful blood thinning agent uh, you know there is warfarin which is a commonly used blood thinning drug comes from that it is a derivative of coumarin so cinnamon can be every day morning i would suggest people to have coumarin to or the cinnamon to be, uh, you know a pinch of cinnamon in a 100 ml of water early morning on an empty stomach you know so these are some of the foods that they can go to rather than going in for aspirin i mean i wouldn't i would yeah yeah Hello, what i meant, <laughs> i am yeah. what i say what i meant was somebody you know they can kind of prevent they can take a preventive action and not wait yeah. for uh, wait for them to take aspirin and then go for it so that's what i mean. yeah thank you thank you doctor uh, so uh, i have few few uh, final questions to dr baburidi so before we end the session so doctor uh, studies have also shown that uh, uh, high uh, genetic risk for heart disease uh, this is nowadays this has almost doubled uh, the risk of heart attack or the stroke so how is hereditary related to heart disease and uh, what can be done to prevent hereditary heart disease yeah so see as you know compared to westerners so indians are high risk for uh, heart disease so that is also we think there are genetically we are different from uh, the westerners one again if you look at the, our society itself there is a clustering of heart attack in certain families so some families will have high risk for example uh, father has heart attack son daughter so like that it is in the same age group in a same family will have multiple uh, cousins having a heart attack so this how to explain this so then the risk, so traditional risk factors are same uh, with the, all the family members and the society but these people are a high risk this is basically some genetic diseases so for there are few diseases i can mention like hypercholesterolemia means there is a familial uh, a condition called high cholesterol levels normally cholesterol around if it is 200 in those families if you look at their cholesterol it will be around 600 800 like that so so these are the genetic variation in some of the genes increases the production of cholesterol those families will have very high risk of heart disease and very younger age even at the age of 20 years people can have less than 20 years people can have heart attack and if you investigate those individuals they will have this one of those genetic problems of cholesterol or the heart muscle disease so these there are few diseases we have very common in uh, like uh, uh, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so these are the conditions where people will have um, high risk of heart disease and also the genetic transmission into the families is more common so hereditary disease we can't it's not a modifiable disease so only can detect early and uh, preventive disease for example if patient has high cholesterol in the family you test all the family members for cholesterol and take a preventive measures by giving medications and lifestyle uh, modifications to prevent the heart attack so we can only postpone the heart attack in those families and early detection will prevent the damage that is more important in hereditary disease so there we are indians are more prone and in indians in some society there will be high risk for heart disease in those people we need to advise them early testing and early uh, precaut- preventive measures so among this early testing doctor so do you uh, suggest for genetic testing because nowadays this has become a very valuable tool for management of inherited diseases right so uh, uh, who who should uh, seek for genetic testing so yeah. uh, among those who there this hereditary uh, uh, diseases are prevalent and uh, yeah. what, especially in case of uh, heart disease what are the uh, major advances uh, in genetic testing yeah 
So genetic testing is not routinely advisable. Why? Because so see if you 99 percent 99.9% of the people doesn't have a genetic uh, disease, and it's very rare. So really? to find out a 1.1% of patient of a genetic disease, we have to test everybody. So that is not practically possible and not advisable. Only those families who have a history of heart disease, in those families, we advise a genetic testing, genetic counseling and advice, not in every individual. So in those families, if we have a heart attack or other heart disease, heart related diseases, so then the risk of having transmission of the heart problems to the siblings will be there more commonly in some gen congenital heart diseases, cardiomyopathies. In those people, we have to advise them for uh, next pregnancy and also those who, what type of uh, food they have to have, what type of drugs they should take and how to prevent the heart related problems. In those certain individuals only, we have to advise the genetic testing. Otherwise, we should not advise in a general population. Okay, okay, doctor. And uh, finally, a very important question. Uh, please let our audience know the right tips to follow and for maintaining a healthy heart. And also, please tell them what kind of tests they have to do regularly in order to uh, prevent these heart issues. Yeah, the prevent say heart disease, heart attacks can be preventive and also uh, preventive if provided we take a regular uh, measures. So what is most important is it should start from our childhood itself. So to prevent the risk factors like uh, in a school cells, schools itself, we have to inculcate that uh, we have a regular importance of the regular uh, exercise, the right diet and proper sleep. So, and also maintaining ideal weight. So these are very important in a young age because atherosclerosis is not a disease of elderly. It starts as early as second decade. That means as early as 15 years or so, the disease process sets in at that stage. It's not at the age what we detect the heart attack. No, that is the end stage of uh, the heart problem. So we are only palliatively treating the heart attack at that stage. To prevent heart attack, we should start very early and take all these few steps. One is the diet, the exercise, and maintaining ideal weight and good sleep. So all the good practices, these things, what are the important moderate way how we have to practice judiciously. So it is very important to educate the people and maintain. Once the heart attack happens or the disease sets in, how to prevent is again, uh, apart from these things, medications. So this pattern has to be inculcated in very early age to prevent uh, future heart attacks. So if you compare our future, uh, previous generations, for example, our father and forefathers, the this diseases like heart attack, diabetes are very rare. But nowadays, because of our changes in the lifestyle, so we, this becoming very common. So these also can be prevented, provided we have a proper education at a very early age. And uh, which test do you recommend regularly, doctor, along with ECG, CO and uh, cholesterol test? Yeah, so this... Uh, because now we have very early uh, ages of heart attack happening in very early young age. So we have to start testing very early. So as early as 30 years, third decade or so, we have to have a general checkup for a ECG, a co treadmill and uh, the risk factor screening like cholesterol and sugars uh, and the, uh, any other risk factors like uh, hypertension and uh, kidney disease. So they all contribute. So this general screening should be at the age of 30 years and then regularly follow every year with the risk factor uh, identification. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. So uh, now I request uh, Dr. Isha, our marketing and communications leader to conduct Q&A session. Thanks, Dr. Jamuna. And thanks, doctors, for a really very insightful session. And uh, it was really interesting and keeping us on near the edge of our seats today. Uh, although as we are nearing up to the ending of our timing for the session, there are just a few questions that, the, uh, that our audience has asked. One of it is from uh, uh, Mr. Krishnan, and he would like to ask, I think so this question will be answered well by uh, Dr. Babu. Uh, are there any medications that can help in reducing the issue of increased heart rate? Yeah, there are medications uh, uh, related to reduce the heart rate only should be advised when there is a uh, people who have definite reason for increased heart rate. For example, some people have uh, type A personality, for example, they have anxiety related issues. 
So if you, those will have high heart rate, but doesn't require a medication for to control the heart rate. In those people, we have to advise the meditation, yoga, and a regular exercise. So this itself will reduce the heart rate. So because as I told, the parasympathetic activity and the sympathetic, some of the people have inherent increase in the sympathetic activity. In those individuals, we have to train them to increase the parasympathetic activity. So in our uh, system, we have yoga and meditation, which is there for a long, long years. So that does a very good job in reducing the heart rate and anxiety. So the regular practice of yoga and meditation will do much more than a medications. Okay. So suggesting, you know, you go with the, these physical activities instead of going to the medication. Medicaid. Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, one more question, I think, so Dr. Deepa, uh, you can help us in that. Um, diabetic and hypertensive patients are suggested, you know, to consume rice lesser as compared to uh, a normal person will do. So are there any healthy alternative to rice that the person can be recommended for? Uh, nowadays, if you can see, you know, the millets, they are coming up in a big way. So any combination, there are many types of millets that you can, you know, it's an acquired taste. Again, I would say that you might not like the taste of it. It might not be in the same lines of rice. But I guess, you know, that's another alternative which has a good amount of, you know, complex carbohydrates than a normal, normal white rice. So they are one option. You know, another option is a quinoa. That's one to, that's come kind of coming up like anything. You know, quinoa is, uh, contains all essential line amino acids present in them. Also, you know, complete protein plus also a carbohydrate content. So that's another alternative. So these are some of the things that you could uh, look for. for. Thank you, Dr. Deepa. Dr. Jamuna, I think so. Uh, we are uh, on our uh, on our schedule right now. So yeah. please uh, take it over now. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Isha. And uh, also thanks, Ashish, for coordinating. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Babu Reddy and Dr. Deepa for your valuable suggestions and tips to keep our heart healthy. I am sure that today's audience understood very well why taking care of heart is very important and uh, to focus on active stress-free lifestyle with proper work-life balance. So uh, dear viewers, leading a healthy life is synonymous to keeping our hearts healthy. Like our experts suggested, Please keep a check on your active lifestyle with regular exercise, good food, and relaxation methods to relieve stress. It is advised to quit smoking as well as consumption of alcohol. Uh, please maintain healthy weight and do necessary health checkups as per the doctor's advice. To avail the benefits of our care plans and diet plans along with care coordination services, please download CureBook app from Play Store. We have introduced various plants under heart care, including post-cardiac surgery care plants and diet plants in CureBook app, especially for those patients who have heart-related issues and also who have undergone heart-related surgeries. We will be very happy to serve you and your healthcare needs. Kindly contact us for subscriptions and any queries. Thank you all for joining today's session. Take care. Bye. Thank you.